Welcome to the final episode of our multiplayer Sims like experience with React 3 Fiber and 3JS. To avoid the need to make many more videos, I decided not to do a step by step tutorial, as you have already the main concepts that I explained in the previous videos. Instead, I coded a lot, we have the final code, we'll have a look at the interesting sections such as the lobby and rooms management, and deploying the project so you can have your own version and start iterating from it. Before starting, a huge thanks to Elestio for sponsoring this video. It's a platform made to deploy open source software and your own projects very easily. I'm a developer advocate for this company and make weekly videos on their YouTube channel. So don't hesitate to have a look at it, the link is in the description below. But we'll get back to it in the deploy part of the video. That being said, let's have a look at the final project. After cloning the repository, as always, you have two folders. You have the server one, you can run yarn to install the dependencies if it's not already done, and run yarn dev to start the socket.io server. Then in another terminal, go to the client folder, it's where we have our client project, our React Refiber one, and run yarn and yarn dev. You can click on the link here to open your project. And this is what we have. We have that nice animation with a lobby. We can find different rooms. We have our avatar already loaded here that is saying hello to us. Let's talk a bit about that lobby here, not the rooms yet. I found the skyscraper model on Poly Pizza and I duplicated it in the background three times with different scales. Same for the tablet, I think it's this one from Polypizza. If I reload, you can see that the tablet is coming from the bottom to the top. I made it with Framer Motion, so you have a motion.group. The initial position is either 0.5 or 1.5, and then it animates to its new final position. You can see that if we are using the first load, we are putting it below, but if we are already loaded, we have already at the final position. It's because when we go into a room and we go back to lobby, it's coming way faster than the initial one that is slow and appearing with a nice reveal effect. One nice addition is the camera control. You can see when I join room, the camera smoothly translates to a new position. So here it's going from top to the middle of the scene and to our avatar. But when we open the lobby, it's coming from the sky to the position in front of our scene. To do this, I'm using camera controls from Dry Library, but it's an implementation of another library. This is the camera controls from Yomotsu, and you can find all the documentation on this GitHub repository. If we go back to Dry Library, we have an example here with all the things you can do on it. In the example, there are a lot of options you can use to move the camera and understand how it works if you want to go in depth into it. But I'm using it very simply. What I did is I have a reference on camera controls in the experience. I disabled all events because I just want to control myself the camera and not let the user interact with it. Then we have the logic on the controls. We have the reference and we have a use effect on the different state to adapt the position of the camera. So we have if we didn't load the experience yet, we have the initial position. On the camera controls, we have the set position, so it's the position of the camera, and the target where it's looking at. You have the same on orbit controls, but with the camera controls, you can add the true parameter that will smoothly do the transition from the position and target based on the camera settings. But I'm using the default ones and it looks good. So it's quite simple. I decided some 
position and target based on the mode. If we are in the lobby, if we are in shop mode and build mode, and if we are following a character. Let's see the different ones we have. If I join a room, it's following my character. If I open the shop, well, it's the room edition first. You, you see that nice effect, how it smoothly transitioned to it. And if I open the shop, we also have a nice camera transition. Last thing to talk about before jumping into that nice room section is the avatar. I made different things. The first one is when we change our avatar, let's have a look at it. I choose this one. If I reload, I have the new avatar. It's because I'm saving it into the local storage. In UI, in avatar creator callback on avatar exported, I'm doing a local storage set item with the new avatar URL. Then if we go on top of the file, we can see that the base URL we are using is either the one from our local storage or another one that I wrote manually. I had some lag issue when doing the animation because of the Ready Player Me avatar because by default it's the full resolution that is used and it needs a lot of resources. Instead, I decided to use a simpler one. You can see in the documentation there are some query string parameters we can use like the quality or level of detail to decrease the quality to be more resource intensive and to have a smaller file size. That's what you can see here with quality is equal to medium and mesh load is equal to one. And last thing I did is go to lobby avatar. So I used another component for the avatar for the lobby, but still we are loading the same file. And for the transition of the animation, when it's the first time, I'm setting it to zero. Let's have a look why I did it instead of 0 0.32. It's because when we change our avatar, it's loading and then it appears in typo. So we see the animation of the arms. Let's change again. You can see it's not smooth. So instead, if it's the first one, we load that new file. Let's try it again. We change to another avatar and you can see it directly is in the correct position. Time to talk about the room system. Let's jump into index and go to the server file to understand how it works. First of all, if we go to the files here in the server, I created a default.json. It's the definition of our room and it's what we will save, but we need a default one. So our starting value is the four rooms we see with the name, the password, of course you can update it on your own server, and the different items we have. So it's the same logic than before, just split it into different rooms. Then when we do modification inside our rooms, so in a room, we write a new file named rooms.json. You can see we have one here, rooms.json. It contains all the modifications we made and it's our save of the server. I decided to store it into a JSON file on the server instead of using a database. So the deployment is easier for you. But of course you can store all those information into a database. You can see here the color is gray because I ignored it in the git ignore. And by default, let's search for rooms.json our server will try to load that file and if it doesn't find it, it will load the default one. So you don't need to have a save for your server to work and have some rooms available as a starting point. Before we had global values for the map and the items, but now it's in the rooms array. For each room, we have exactly the same logic we had before. I just decided to fix the size to 77 so the camera position is easier but all the rest is exactly the same. I just updated the method that required it. So generate random position, now take a room instead of the global variable that we used before. We have a join room method to say on what room we are and inside our socket we have, so it's the connection for one user. We have the room it is in, by default it's in the lobby, so it's in no room and the character it's using. When our user connects to the server, we will send to him a welcome message with all the rooms available and all the items available. On the client side, on the socket manager, 
if we search for welcome, we just set globally our rooms and our items. We get the items so early, so we can preload all of them here. So our loader will include all those models and we don't have loading times during the experience. Okay, so let's continue about our logic of rooms. It's the same concept, but when we join a room with our socket here, we also use the room system from socket.io. What we have to do is socket.join and room ID. It will join a room inside the socket system. Let's have a look at what are rooms in socket.io documentation. It's a channel that sockets can join and leave so we can emit message directly to one specific room. It's what we need to say our player movements, our player messages and interactions. Let's follow the logic when we join a room. We get the room we want to join. If we find one, we will join the room inside the socket. We will create our character. We will add a session ID, a generate a random position for it and use the avatar URL that the user is using. Then we push the new character into the room and we emit with socket emit. It's the one that is joining the room. We confirm the user that it joined the room with the map and the different characters. Then we call on room update. And this, what it is doing is it will send a message to all the people in that specific room with io.2 and room ID. It will send it to the room of the user. So everyone will be notified that the characters change. So we have the new one in the list of characters. And we also emit the rooms event for updating our lobby. Let's have a look at it. For example, we have two people in the lobby. One is joining it, so it's updated for the other user. And this is it for when we join a room. Then we have, for example, the move event that changed a bit. We just have to use the room to find the path and to emit the event only to the room instead of doing it globally like before. Let's have a look at some polishes I did for the project. The first one is I added a chat. So if we go here and we say hello, we'll send a message. It will be displayed on top of the character and everyone see it. It works on both ways. You can still continue to dance. Let's have a look at the backend code for this. I made a very simple chat because there is no save of the messages that have been sent previously. It's live messages. So what we have is on chat message we will emit to the room the message from that user. So where do we listen to that event? It's directly on the avatar. We will search for chat message. Here, we listen to player chat message. And if it corresponds to the user that has sent the message, then we will display the chat message on top of it. And after three seconds and a half, we will clear the message. Of course, it's up to you if you want to store the message and to display a classic box with all the previous messages. I also added a new feature in the addition of the room. First, the password. So it's very easy. It's comparing the string before entering in the room. And now an item, you can cancel what you are doing onto it but you can also delete it. And before we couldn't remove items, so it was very useful. I also did another fix in the shop, is we had some items that were facing the opposite direction, so we couldn't see them clearly. And ju I just added the rotation of the item so we can see all the items correctly. I also had to change the movement speed to something higher. And in the use frame that is applying our movement speed, to multiply it by delta to follow the frame rate. So on different screen, I didn't have the same movement speed and it was bad. One last thing I did is here in edit mode, I'm using the default shadow. So you can see it's real time shadows. But when we go back into the experience, you can see that we have somehow baked shadows and it looks way more uh, natural and realistic. To do it, I'm using the accumulative shadows from dry library. You can see the example here. And what it does, let's reload because we can see it in real time. It's baking shadows for a certain number of frames. So here it's 100 frames and it will create nice shadows based on another component named randomized light that will be applied 
at different position. I'm doing exactly the same with different parameter for the color and the randomized light position. But you can see that I memoized it. Oh, but here is the lobby. We need to go into the room to see why I memoized it. It's more interesting. So I memoized it based on the items because if the items change, I need to rebake my shadows for 42 frames. Now we have our project ready to be deployed and run. Maybe there are some fixes and adjustments that we can do later, but I'm pretty happy with that version and I want to deploy it. We'll be using LSTO to deploy our project. You can choose Netlify or Versal because Socket.io and the backend you can't run on them. Let's start and go to LSTO, hit login. On the left, go to CICD because we want to create CICD pipeline. I have already two of them for my React Prefiber course run create a new CI CD pipeline. Then you have two options. Either you select from a GitHub repository of you, so you connect your GitHub account and you select your repo. It's what I will do. Or scroll down and import third-party Git repository and enter my repo address. But instead, I recommend you to fork my project and be on your own account. So when you will do modification, you still have it deployed over time. So let's select our project, import. We'll start by deploying the socket IO server. Let's deploy on a new VM. Single node, I can choose my cloud provider. I will keep Hetzner. I have the choice between different service plan. So basically it's how many CPU and RAM you have. You can switch to Ampere Ultra to have access to ARM instances. I will choose this one and hit next. As we want to deploy the server, I will name it server. The branch I use is the main, I only have this one. We have the choice between a static website or a full stack app. And because it's a Node.js server, we need to choose this one. Runtime is Node.js. We can keep the default version. We don't need a framework and the root directory is slash server. And then we go to build and output settings. To install the dependencies, it's yarn install. To run the server, it's yarn start. And we don't have a build, so we can just skip it. Then you have different options available, but for now we don't need them. We can do and create the ICD pipeline. Now it's creating our server and then it will build and deploy our backend. I received an email telling me that my instance is ready, so it will start the build. I can see in real time what is doing and I can see that it is deployed. Now our server is running at this address, but it's a backend, so we can't have a look at it. So let's go back to target and we will deploy a new pipeline. So on the same server for the same price, we will have our front end and back end host at the same place. You can add as many projects as your server can support. Again, I select my project, Sims Online. So I deploy on the same VM, hit next. And this time it's the React app made with Vit that we want to deploy. So it's static website. The root is client then build and output settings. There is an issue between Docker and Vit, so we need to add it globally. It's yarn global add Vit, and we can do our install command. Then to build our project, it's yarn build, and the output directory is dist. But here we need to add an environment variable to tell what is the address of our server. You can open socket manager, and you can see here we connect to socket.io with either localhost if we don't have environment variable or vit underscore server URL. So let's define that variable. We paste it is equal to in another tab, we open it and we check the CNAME for our server and we paste it here. Now we can create our CI CD pipeline. Is everything correct? Oh, here we need to rename it to client. Now we can create our CI CD pipeline. Now it's building, we can open it, view build logs and see in real time what is happening. It's installing the dependencies, it's the same process than when you build locally. It finished building and deploying our instance, we can close it. Go to details and open our website by clicking here. We can see we have an issue because it's not connecting to the server. It's because it's required course policy. It's something we anticipated. So by default, when you run locally, it's accepting only local host and this port, but you can add the environment variable with the client URL. So go back to the server, build and deploy. We couldn't do it before because we needed the front end to be deployed. 
go to environment variables, client URL, and paste the URL of your client. Then go on the top right and apply changes. Continue and it will redeploy your project. When you do changes to your configuration, you receive an email telling you if it worked or failed. Here it seems it worked. And when we reload our project, it's correctly working with the rooms available here and we can make it work. It's a bit slower because now it's network related. Our project is now deployed and live. And because your project is linked to your GitHub repository, if you commit new changes into the main branch, it will automatically rebuild and deploy your new version. Thank you for watching. I'm very curious about what you think of this video, as it's very different from what I'm used to do. Let me know in the comments as your feedbacks always help the channel go in the right direction. Don't forget to like and subscribe to not miss the upcoming videos. But if you want to continue your learning journey, you can watch my video available here.